Okay, so I guess we're a couple minutes ahead, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll use that time uh, for a live demo thingy or a live coding thing for the Jupyter part. So um, this talk is about uh, using Python and Jupyter here at NERSC. And uh, before I give this talk, I usually like to see if there are Python users in the audience. So could you like raise your hands if you use Python? Not even at NERSC, just like in your daily life. So, you know, like. So um, if you see anything up here like that you use regularly, like I don't want to go through all of these, but like are there a lot of, you know, NumPy, SciPy type of users in the room? So I'm seeing some nodding heads, pandas people maybe. Not as much, maybe. Um, how about uh, scikit-learn, TensorFlow, the machine learning kind of toolkit? Not, not so much. Um, any Numba users? MPI for Pi? MPI users? OK. All right. And how about in terms of visualization, non-matplotlib stuff? Are there Seaborn users? Well, OK, so matplotlib, I think everybody. But Seaborn, you know, it seems like it. OK. All right. So. All right, so there's some, there are Python users in the room, and I think that um, um, you should be comforted to know that you're not alone uh, at NERSC, that um, there's something like, I think we mentioned earlier that we use this modules software system for loading up the software that you want to customize your user experience. There's over 100,000 uh, module load Pythons done per day across the two systems using four different modules. A lot of this is automated, so a lot of this is actually just people logging in and they have module load Python in their bash RC or whatever, but um, people are using it for production jobs for some, lots of smaller jobs, but there are a few larger scale jobs that are using Python in HPC. Um, I think it's interesting to note that um, I have a friend that, um, this was before I worked at NERSC, wrote into the consultants maybe about 10 years ago asking could we have Python installed on, I don't know what it was, but back then, Franklin or something? And the answer was no, that's not a high performance computing programming language. You can't have Python. We're not going to support it. But um, we do now. It's not, <laughs> it's not optional anymore. Um, but yeah, basically 250 users per day, not including staff, are using Python. And there's like 700 active users per day, I think. Um, so. What this talk is about is if you're a Python user, there's some things you need to know about how you use Python uh, on the Cray systems and, and how we deliver Python to users. Um, there's just a few things that you should probably know that will probably save you time down the line. And one of them is knowing that we do have documentation. There's kind of six or seven kind of big pages about how to do different things with Python and why we provide Python the way that we do. We try to keep it up to date. There's a frequently asked questions page, which is, is pretty new, um, but there are some questions that always do come up. So check there first before you file a ticket. I think that would save you some time. There's also a, a page for advice or gotchas if you want to try to use Python on, on KNL. Um, so uh, again, I can't say this enough. Like Probably like uh, once a week, I get uh, a ticket where actually the person's using the wrong Python. Um, basically, the point is don't don't use this, don't use user bin Python. That's the Python that is installed uh, when they deliver the system to us. And it's usually pretty old by the time you get around to using it. So um, instead, always be sure that you do a module load Python of some sort. And you can pick whether or not you want to be a, a Python 2.7 person or a Python 3.6 person. Um, and in fact, if you don't want to use the modules that we, that we provide, you can install your own. You can do whatever you want, basically. Um, in terms of Python. And even if you do an installation of your own and you have problems, you can still send us tickets and we'll help you debug that. Yeah? I, I realized that I saw something on the slide that I didn't want to raise my hand, but hmm. you have Python 3 as well, right? Yeah. Like yes. Um, yeah, let me, I'll come, come back to that to tell you about the defaults and, and what we're doing there. So um, for a while now, NERSC's uh, Python is Anaconda Python. Are people familiar with the Anaconda distribution for Python? It seems to be the way that people are using Python today is they're using Anaconda Python. So um, we see that, and so we decided that's, that's a way to provide Python to users, if that's especially what they like. It's nice and familiar to them. Um, so we've retired our own builds. Um, there is a, a Cray Python there, but it's pretty, it's pretty minimal. 
the modules that I mentioned, they exclusively leverage Anaconda Python. Um, if you know virtual env, but you don't know Anaconda, the only thing you really need to know is that Conda, this Conda tool basically replaces virtual env and then goes way beyond that. So package management with Conda is what you, is with the Conda tool is what you get. Of course, there's hundreds, actually there's many, many more than hundreds of useful packages now in the Anaconda Python. You have the threaded MKL library built into Anaconda Python, it comes for free. Um, there are some additional, many more actually now machine learning tools uh, in the defaults channel. And then there's ways to get packages from other people who've packaged up software through this mechanism called channels. So I'm not gonna go into great detail about uh, how Conda environments work, but um, if you run into problems provisioning your own Conda environment, uh, I can help you debug that. Um, oh, in addition to that, we have a couple of extra things that you need to know about um, if you use if you use MPI or, or HDF5 or H5Py and you want to use like do multi-node jobs, we, I, can, I can address that in a little bit. All right, so the Python modules on both systems are, are these two here, 2.7 Anaconda 4.4 and 3.6 Anaconda 4.4. 2.7 Anaconda 4.4 is the default now, so if you just do module load Python, that's the one you're gonna get. And that is gonna be the one that you get for like the next 21 months or so as the default uh, because I can't make it come up. But um, there's this, this website down here, you can't see right there, but it tells you, gives you a countdown for how long you have until Python 2.7 is no more and you have to use Python 3.6 uh, or Python 3. So for, for now, that's going to be the default, but in maybe 20 months or so, we'll start pointing at Python 3. Why do you have to wait 20 months? Why not? Because the, the statistics are that users are mostly still using Python 2. Yeah. I could try to make them do it, but they probably just would complain. <laughs> Does that stop us? But yeah. Anyway, like I said, you can, do, you can do your own stuff. If for whatever reason you don't like, kinda, you don't like our modules, I, we, we put them there kind of as a, a way for users to get started, and lots of people are just fine with that. But, um, sometimes people want to customize them or they want to bring in other packages that come from other channels that, that we, don't, we don't know about. Um, they, you, know, you, can, you can set up your own environments, but if you want to do your, your, your own installation somewhere, you can, you can do that yourself. In fact, if you want to use the global common, um, global common software directory, a way to put your own Python installation there is to just grab the Miniconda uh, bash installer and run it there. And then you can provide some kind of Python uh, environment that you and your collaborators like to use to all your collaborators. And um, one piece of advice that's, that's pretty important is if you're going to use MPI from Python or you're going to use H5Py parallel, okay, you don't just want to do conda install MPI for Py. That's not going to work um, and it will be very confusing to you. Um, what you need to do is you need to build MPI for Py against the Cray and Pitch. Uh, but it's very easy, as we saw this morning, it's really easy to use the nice Cray wrappers. And that's basically all that you do here, is you just build it and you say, point me at the, at the right C, uh, C compiler. And that's it, okay? So that's pretty straightforward. So the, you only need to do this if you create your own Conda environment or you do your own installation uh, with, the, with, this, with this bash script, okay? If you use our Python, it's already built that way. Okay, um, a few words about parallelism with Python. Um, within a node, um, you know, people are always kind of interested in how, how they can improve the performance of their Python code uh, at NERSC. Um, within a node, the way to, to, to improve performance through parallelism is um, using OpenMP threaded math libraries generally. That's the easiest way to go. And knowing a little bit about um, OpenMP uh, environment variables and things like that will, will probably help. Multiprocessing. Uh, works too. Multiprocessing is a process-based parallelism, um, and that works okay within a node. Um, but that won't scale really across a node, okay, so to get or beyond one node. So if you want to use like 10 nodes and you want to do like a, a parallel Python processing, you have to do something else, and that's MPI for Pi. Basically, that's, that's kind of the thing that we know and, and love the best. Other, um, other frameworks like Dask and PySpark, um, they work. Um, PySpark works actually pretty well. Dask, we haven't been able to really scale up um, uh, 
uh, but it's not really built to scale up, say, to like the whole machine or anything like that. Um, in terms of um, how to combine parallelism to get both um, within a node and multi-node parallelism is to combine MPI for Pi and, and threaded math libraries. Combining MPI for Pi and multiprocessing, for instance, doesn't work. Um, and the, re the reasons for that are, well, it, it will look like it works until the day you, you really need it to work. It, it, it will have a strange cryptic error when it crashes. We've worked with Cray a little bit on trying to understand why that's going on, but basically combining MPI and, and fork is kind of dicey. Um, Profiling and debugging Python applications. Um, in general, it's not, um, yeah, it's not just a specific question about like how do I, you know, how do I do that at NERSC. It's it's kind of a general question, but um, the you can do print that obviously works. Um, the only advice I have is if you're going to put print statements in and run a job, you want to get the output unbuffered. So that's what these dash u's here are for. Okay. Because otherwise it will run and you'll be like, it's not producing output. Why isn't it producing output? But if you do that, then you'll, you'll see everything basically. It will hurt performance, but you're looking for your print statements really. Yeah? Why do you need Q? Need, so you need the U for S run and Python. Yeah. <laughs> the, but it's true. OK, but going beyond print. Unbuffered. No, no, I know the S run might offset, but the Python after, yeah. minus U after Python. Yeah. Is it U or minus Yes, U. Really? Works for me. Yeah. <laughs> Python dash C will mean, uh, that means take the string that comes after this and interpret it as Python and run that. Yeah, that's what C is. Uh, okay. Moving beyond print, though, you want it to be a little bit more uh, sophisticated, maybe, or, or you've done everything that you can with print, what can you do? Um, in terms of, uh, you know, we, we try to look at this ourselves and, and try to see what we can advise users to do in terms of understanding performance. Um, uh, and, and a lot of users are, are familiar with the, the profiling tools that come with Python. So cProfile is a, is a built-in module that comes with Python for, for looking at performance of Python code. We think that, that that works pretty well um, in combination with SnakeViz or this tool called gprof 2 dot which you can see here like a kind of a, a tree of, your, of an application that actually Lori made in the back there that tells you like here's where the code is spending most of its time. And it's nice and graphical and you can follow that. Um, if you have um, lots of MPI processes, there's a, a handy trick that a, a NERSC user uses that um, this is actually a link here. This shows you how you can actually turn on profiling and turn it off. And you can get like one profile per MPI rank or just the MPI rank you're interested in. It's actually pretty easy. It's like five lines of code. Um, for a little bit of a deeper dive after you've done maybe a, a C profile on your uh, run on your application, you can slap on line profiler, which is a separate module. You have to kind of install that. Um, and you just put a decorator on whatever function you think is your hotspot. And you can see how much time you're spending on basically each line in that function. Um, if you want to get um, kind of deeper into, the, into how, where your code is spending its time, um, a postdoc here has put together um, a package called Time Memory, which is actually a high performance uh, timer that you instrument into your code. It's not like C profile where it figures out how to, how to, where to measure all of the time. You have to actually tell it measure this function. But it not only does it tell you how much time you spent in that function, it tells you like how much what the Resonance set size is at that point, CPU, time, wall time, all of that. So if you, if you start running out of memory, say, and you start getting oom um killed when you run a job, this can be a way to sort of see where's the high watermark in your code and try to do something about that. Um, and then at the very bottom, um, Wusan talked earlier about some tools for um, performance profiling from, uh, from our vendors. Um, one that, that works with Python is Intel VTune, but only um, three uh, collection, uh, collection tools work within VTune for Python. And um, getting, it, getting it to show you um, the, the, piece of the information that you really need to address perf a performance bottleneck can be um, pretty tricky. So fortunately, we have um, VTune training uh, events at NERSC, and so if you show up and you have a Python code and you want to try VTune on it, we can maybe sit with you and, and try it. But I'd, I'd say that start up here 
and move your way down here. Okay. Um, shifter is going to be after this. If you start running Python applications that are going to go to like thousands of MPI ranks or something like that, or even a few hundred MPI ranks, you're actually going to want to put your, your application stack into a Docker container and use Shifter to run it. So Shane will tell you how to do that after this talk. Um, now for the Jupyter part of the talk. Um, we have a node on Cori that's basically a repurposed login node where we um, allow users to spawn uh, Jupyter notebooks. And we, we give users a place to do this so that they don't do it themselves in maybe an insecure way. Um, in addition to that, we have an external service called, um, we have an external service um, that you, know, you may want to use if say Cori is down. But they're, they're at these two different URLs. So this is the external one, the one that's external to Cori, and then this is the one that actually runs on Cori. And you get different things with these two different, um, these two different websites. So these are, of course, external to the craze. They can't see the Scratch file system, which may be important for you, but they can see the rest of the NERSC global file system. The one that's on Cori can see Cori Scratch, obviously. And you can actually even like, submit jobs from a notebook with this magic S batch here. Okay. All right, so if there's one thing, by the way, who's, are there Jupyter users in the room? Say people have used it before, okay. So this is like the number one question that I get um, probably twice a week. How do I set up my own kernel, right? A kernel is a process that you launch that basically runs the calculation for you in the notebook, right? How do I, make a conda environment for myself and make that now a Jupyter kernel, right? So they, people will set up a bunch of packages that they like, and then they want to be able to access that uh, from Jupyter dev. So there's a few different ways to accomplish this, but this is kind of the, the easy way of doing it. So I think, I think it would be fun to do this um, this way. In fact, I have, to, I have to log in, so I even get to demo uh, the the one-time password thing. <laughs> ha, just in time. Okay, um, so the first thing you need to do, um, which, which Python, right? The very first thing, as I said before, was don't use this guy, right? Do this. What is my, I want to make sure my example. Is, is right, module load Python, okay? So, which Python? So it's not user bin Python anymore, it's this user common software Python blah blah stuff, right? Okay, so what we wanna do now is we wanna make a conda environment. Conda create dash n, let's call it um, early user Python 3.6, okay. This is kind of new behavior. If you've been using the conda tool, you didn't have to do this before, okay? It would just pick, pick, it would just install the Python into that environment that you were already using. That's not the case anymore. And that was kind of a surprise to me. So you do wanna do something like say, I want this to be a Python 3.6 environment before you install any other packages. If I were to install NumPy, I don't know which one I would get, <laughs> yeah. Yep, I can do that. The conda tool is the same in either Python 3.6 or 2.7. The, the dash n flag is just a name? Yep. Hopefully I have all these cached and it won't actually download them all. And how am I doing on time? I have six minutes, all right. Any other questions while this is uh, spinning there? All right. Ha, they were cached, okay. Source, activate, early user, and we'll install something, conda install AstroPy. Okay, meanwhile, yes, do that. Meanwhile, I'll go over here and I'll log into jupyterdev.nursc.gov. Okay, so jupyterdev.nursc.gov, and you just use your NERSC username and password. There it is, all right. 
Okay, so I've made a, an environment called early user, okay, and it's got one package in it. I have to install another one now. Kind of install IPy kernel, okay. Putting this into the package actually kind of just makes it a kernel already. We have a, a, thing, a package called nbconda, which makes anaconda detect your environments and just make them kernels on the fly. And this helps it do that. It also is required for making it into a, an actual kernel. Sorry, probably should have had these cached. Five minutes. <laughs> I don't know what half of these things are. <laughs> and check the next thing I'm supposed to do, right? Is, uh, yeah. All right, here's the magic part that makes this into a kernel. Python dash m. That means run this module as a script, kinda. Install, give it a name like early user kernel, and then uh, I'm cheating, dash dash user. And what that does is that makes this thing called a kernel spec file. And it looks like this, it's this JSON, JSON thing which says like use my Python to launch the kernel. And you can actually customize this with like environment variables and things like that. Um, so if I go back <coughs> over here, no, get out of the way. Um, I may need to restart my server so it pops up. I like how it doesn't bother to say like start my server, it just says <laughs> my server. Okay, and then if I go over here, I ought to see my kernel. Here it is, early user kernel, right? And so, uh, okay, and so there, it's the, the Python that I just put into this environment, okay? All right, so that's how you can take a Conda environment and make it into a kernel lickety split. Okay, so um, just a couple things to add to that. So this, this is the backup, right, if that didn't work. Uh, this would have been a lot more boring, right? Um, but you can, you can uh, customize that, that kernel spec file uh, by adding a, a little dictionary here that adds whatever environment variables you want. So if there's like some executable you need, you can add that to the path there. And then actually, if you wanna take advantage of modules in your kernel, like you don't wanna install your own LaTeX and you're one of those people that really likes LaTeX labels on your matplotlib figures, um, you can, <laughs> honestly, when people write that ticket, I just go, do you really have to have this? But this is, this is how you can do it. You, you, you replace that, um, that Python executable with some shell script that's executable. You, you set it to be executable, and then you do whatever module load you need in here, and then you just pass in these arguments to, the, to, the, to Python there, okay? And then the really handy thing is when you run on Jupyter Dev, there is in your home directory a jupyter.log, and it tells you like what's going on. So if you have problems, um, that's interesting. If you have if you have issues trying to get this to work, the first place to look is the jupyter.log in your in your home directory. Okay, so it's very very handy. Okay, so that's the end of the Python and Jupyter talk. Um, basically, the point is we try to make the Python like not, not really weird. And I think by, by making it um, come from the Anaconda distribution, we're giving people what they're really used to. And um, Jupyter is available and you can, you can use it. And we're trying to expand the Jupyter service and sometime this year we should be able to run Jupyter notebooks on compute nodes. In fact, we can do that on a test bed, but there's a lot of technical and policy stuff that has to be addressed before we can do that on Cori.